All right, 9.00 Eastern Standard Time. Good morning. Hi, everybody that's able to join us this morning. Um, the Chesapeake Region Safety Council would like to welcome again our friend and partner, Adele Abrams. Today, she'll be uh, presenting on the new MSHA rules, silica and surface mobile equipment. Um, many of you joined us back in April, I think it was, it could have been March, March or April, where Adele reviewed the uh, OSHA and MSHA new rules and enforcement initiatives. Um, today, she's going to drive it home with um, with uh, what is um, what are the new rules and uh, and what's changed, what landed, what maybe what didn't. Um, we look forward to this getting this update. Um, today I have with me Kate Cavanaugh, an, inst an instructor here at Chesapeake Region Safety Council and industrial hygienist. Kate's going to help me out today by keeping an eye on that Q&A. So if you have questions during Adele's presentation, feel free to pop questions in there. Um, there's a chat feature and a Q&A feature, and we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end. Um, and if something gets left behind or there are some outlying questions that Adele just can't answer today, but maybe have more answers even on tomorrow, <laughs> as you'll see, uh, we'll, my, the Chesapeake Region Safety Council or Adele will be happy to reach back out to you. So um, as we go, feel free to pop questions in there. Um, and um, And then if you have questions Later, if you want to just take a look at our email and phone number here, um, grab your phone, take a picture, um, and you can always reach back out to us later. So um, I think most of our attendees here have uh, attended some of our webinars with Adele before, but just oh, here, I'll stop sharing so we can see everybody, so you can see everyone. Um, Adele is an attorney. Um, ASP and uh, president of the law office of Adele Abrams and um, works has offices in Beltsville, Maryland, Denver, Colorado, Charleston, and West Virginia. Um, Adele is a past uh, CEO of the Chesapeake Region Safety Council, um, and we're really honored and thankful that we have her in our court to help us through um, a lot of these uh, new changes and updates. So Adele, I could see your presentation just fine, and I'll go ahead and pass you the wand. Hey, well, great. And uh, I was telling Kim before we got started uh, in kind of a joking, not joking uh, frame of mind that the same slide deck I just presented live to a group in a five hour workshop. So you're gonna be getting five hours worth of material in uh, the next uh, 60 minutes, plus or minus. And then uh, I will take questions uh, at the end of that. I can stay on and hopefully you can as well, but there's a lot to talk about here. And when I was doing the, uh, the five hour magnus opus, uh, three hours of it was on the Amsha Silica rule. And to be honest, we didn't even really scratch the full surface on that. So I'm hopeful that uh, we will be able to do uh, some courses as we did uh, for the OSHA silica rule um, as we get a little nearer to the implementation time of this with Chesapeake Region Safety Council, because there's a lot of heavy lifting here. And it is very, very different from the OSHA rule that, you know, that's probably the single biggest takeaway for you today. And I know I'm, I'm usually speaking to a lot of companies on these who are contractors who do work at mine sites. You might be the electrical or mechanical contractors or construction companies, or you may be uh, some of my clients who have a quarry, but then they also have a ready mix operation or a paving operation. So you're, you know, you're a hybrid, you're under OSHA for some of your operations. And then you have a cement plant or a sand and gravel operation or a quarry that is under MSHA jurisdiction. And you're the ones who are going to be probably um, impacted most adversely by this, especially if you do move people from one arm of your company to the other, um, you're already dealing with this to a certain extent because you have workers on your, your OSHA regulated side who are protected down to 50 micrograms per cubic meter and have been since 2017 uh, effectively. And on the MSHA side, the current exposure limit is still the, it's a, it's a formula, but it's the equivalent of 100 micrograms per cubic meter. So twice as much as you can be exposed to on the OSHA side. And of course, that's why we're here with the rulemaking. But I have, I want to say this right out of the gate. If you have both OSHA and MSHA regulated workers, please protect them all 
for now down to that 50 microgram level to the extent that you, that it is feasible to do so. You're going to have to do it under this rule uh, sooner or later. But, you know, from a more in my view, a moral and an ethical perspective, you really can't discriminate in that sense and allow people to be exposed to twice as much of a group one human carcinogen as their coworkers on the other side of the fence line or the other side of the property road. So, you know, let's be sensible about this. And I will tell you, I have had clients having workers comp claims coming from their former uh, now retired mine workers. And I'm talking about mine workers as in sand plants, you know, not underground coal. And, you know, they're claiming they have lung cancer. It's due to silica exposure. And when my clients look at their sampling, if they have them, they go, well, we were compliant. We're, we're safe here. But their limits, the, excuse me, their sample results are all above 50 even though they may all be below 100. And they're having to eat those claims because there's already a U.S. Court of Appeals, D.C. Circuit, Judge Merrick Garland, back before he was our attorney general, he sprinkled holy water on that OSHA rule and the findings that 50 micrograms is a legit level to use as a permissible exposure limit, that it is technically and economically feasible. Now put an asterisk by what I just said there on the OSHA side of the fence. MSHA made some substantive changes, though, in their approach to the rule, which make me really start wondering, is it going to be found to be feasible? Because I know an awful lot of mine operators who think that it is not going to be feasible uh, for reasons that I'm going to explain to you now. <laughs> That's the spoiler here, you know, the, te the teaser, rather. Stick, stick around. So I've given you the link to the rule. It came out in the Federal Register on April 18th. Uh, of this year, and it covers all sectors. And therein lies the problem, because despite the overwhelming uh, comments to the, the contrary, saying have a separate rule for metal, non-metal, and publish a separate rule for coal, they wanted to do a unitary rule. Um, but in, in effect, it really is two different rules within one because the coal people are not going to have to do the same type of sampling um, that uh, the metal and non-metal side are because it's rolled into their coal dust uh, ventilation plans and and management plans and you know their medical surveillance program has been up and running for years so they don't need the lead up to this but what they've done is imported the worst aspects of the limitations from the Coal Act onto metal and non-metal, which their act in 1978 uh, did not have a limitation, uh, uh, a prohibition, I should say, on the use of respirators, which the Coal Act does. You know, you can't use them for compliance purposes. So what did that do? Boom, it just blew table one in the OSHA construction rule right out of the water. and barred the use of that. Um, another thing you'll see in, in the presentation, again, I'm, I'm giving a few teasers here, is that the coal sector for years, when in their medical surveillance program, those results by the, the op doc, the, the physician and licensed healthcare professional, automatically have to be sent to NIOSH for review for black lung, the black lung benefits. And now MSHA has embedded into this rule for metal and non-metal, you also, your results of your medical surveillance are going to be sent by the doc straight to NIOSH. This is going to lead to some complications, and I will talk about that uh, again, time permitting, as we, we get to that uh, portion of the program. So, um, you know, that those are two changes that came straight from the coal fields, coal dust program, and are now being rolled out at stone, sand and gravel, cement operations, and impacting the contractors who work at those properties. So again, let's be real clear on this. If you're a construction company and you're putting up a new scale house at a quarry, you know, in Maryland, um, and you are 100% compliant with the OSHA silica rule, you will still be eligible to be cited by MSHA once this rule takes effect to the extent of up to $324,000 in penalties. Any of your agents of management 
who are not in compliance with the rule themselves. Maybe they're wearing an N95 mask. Oh, the horror. Yeah, those are banned now by MSHA uh, under this new rule. Um, you have to have respiratory protection that's positive pressure and it has to be rated at 100 or higher. You know, So if, if you are a supervisor and you're wearing the wrong respirator, you can be personally fined by MSHA up to $88,000. And those fines go up every year. So you know, be, be forewarned on this. And you're going to really need to look at what I'm telling you here. And I'm going to jump into this really, you know, with both barrels and start going blah, 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 rambling at you quickly. But build this into your bids. If you're looking at doing a project two years out at a mine site, you know, maybe you're, you're replacing a silo at a cement operation. Build in the fact that you're going to have to have a totally different silica program. And you're going to be subject to inspection by MSHA twice a year surface while you're there, four times a year if you're doing any underground work, and possibly more than that because uh, obviously they're doing, going to be doing um, some walk and talks and spot inspections on silica, as I'll be explaining. And you will be caught up in those. If you're on site and you're not just delivering a package like FedEx or something, they will hang a pump on you if you're going to be there for eight hours. And you're going to be reported under the MSHA system. Um, it will be visible. Those sampling results are all shown on MSHA's uh, dashboard, whereas they are not on the OSHA side of the fence. And um, there's other unique requirements. So again, I'm going to get to the main portion here. Um, but understand, it is a unified rule. Um, we have 931 coal mines in the U.S., and they are the tail wagging the dog for the rule that is going to be affecting over 11,000 metal and non-metal mines, uh, and the vast majority of the miners, obviously, as well. But there are, as MSHA estimates, 75,000 contract miners who work for contractors with MSHA IDs who are going to be affected by this rule as well. Um, there is litigation that's been filed already. There is more to come. Uh, one of the other groups that I'm a member of uh, today uh, messaged me uh, that they are going to be filing an amicus brief in this, uh, along with the National Stone, Sand, and Gravel Association is the lead plaintiff in, in the case that's already been filed. Um, there is another group that is also looking at doing an amicus, and I may be working with them. Uh, but stay tuned. You know, there's there's more to come. And as I will explain here, um, although the effective date of this rule is in our rear view mirror, um, June 17th, 2024, MSHA has been unable to tell me what provisions actually take effect now. The coal provisions kick in next April, um, April 14th, 2025, and then the metal and non-metal portions of the rule take effect April 8th, 2026. So you may say, well, that's two years out or almost two years out. Why am I getting so excited about this? Here's the reason. I expect that the unions are going to sue MSHA saying, why should our members on the metal and non-metal side be exposed to this group one human carcinogen for a year longer than the coal side? And the only explanation MSHA really gave for that additional year, you ready for this one? They said there's not enough laboratories and there aren't enough sampling devices and labs to analyze the samples for an additional, you know, 250,000 miners, especially because on the metal and non-metal side, those 199,000, let's round it and call it 200,000 miners, they're going to be sampled every three months and not everyone, but in many cases, it will be every single miner at a mine. That is a huge number of samples for our fairly limited industrial hygiene support infrastructure to be able to support. And you have to use unique samplers. You have to use a unique analytical method. Um, I'm going to get to that. And, and you know, you, you all will have this material, obviously. But make sure if you're doing silica work now that the lab you're using is capable of doing this work and lock them in to a contract so that they will support you on the, the uh the MSHA side of the fence too. Uh, but the key is, I think that there's a better than average chance, depending on what circuit gets this case, because there is some forum shopping going on for sure. Um, I think that a judge could find it reasonable to say there should be a unitary implementation date 
and that should be 2025. Um, the Mine Act is a technology forcing statute. And as such, they have done this before with the diesel particulate standard. And yes, MSHA regulates diesel particulate, OSHA doesn't. Um, they The sampler that they designated wasn't even in commercial production at the time that they published the rule, but they kicked it out a couple of years and said, you know, the market forces will make these available. And, you know, sure enough, uh, that did occur. So there's going to be something like that, I think, that occurs here. Um, but, you know, will they still have this bifurcated deadline? Stand by, you know, see what they come up with. Um, the the rule itself, um, it establishes the 50 microgram per cubic meter um, permissible exposure limit. Um, they're using an eight hour uh, time weighted average for this, but they are recognizing that there are longer shifts at the mines. And um, really, because they're going to sample for the full shift, um, that is going to create even harder uh, problems with compliance because that could effectively bring what you can be exposed to on an eight hour shift down to about, you know, 35 or 40 micrograms. So again, we're working out the math on all of that. Um, just like OSHA, uh, they did uh, adopt uh, an action level of 25 micrograms per cubic meter. And that is also the uh, TLV that is currently uh, used by the ACGIH, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. And under the OSHA rule, the union sued OSHA saying that the 25 microgram level should be the enforceable Pell. They lost on that. I don't expect them to revisit that, uh, the unions that is, with the MSHA rule. They could just to get their foot in the courthouse and try to get it into a friendlier circuit. Um, but as a practical matter, and, and this, again, herein lies part of the problem. Many of the mines I work with, the background levels of respirable crystal and silica are hovering right around 25 micrograms, even before you contribute things like crushing and screening and milling and, and you know, uh, uh, blasting, you know, drilling. Um, and so they are really going to have very few positions other than those potentially in control booths or environmentally controlled cabs of equipment who are gonna be consistently below 25. And that's assuming all environmental controls are maintained. Uh, the rule itself has provisions for methods of compliance, uh, exposure monitoring, corrective actions. And this is very different from the OSHA rule. The exposure monitoring, very different from the OSHA rule. The methods of compliance, very different from the OSHA rule. Respiratory protection, yeah, that's different too. Um, and medical surveillance, you bet, that's different as well. And finally, record keeping, of course that's different. Um, and interestingly, um, make note when we get to the record keeping slide, um, since I will be moving quickly here, um, MSHA pretty much has all of the records at five-year retention. There are a couple of them that are a period of employment and six months. Compare that when you get a chance to the OSHA standard 29 CFR 1910.1020, which is the employee uh, uh, record access rule under and also the, the OSHA silica rule, too, because um, what MSHA has adopted here is totally wrong compared with the OSHA rule. Um, the silica rule there, you have to keep exposure samples for period of employment plus 30 years. And MSHA is saying dump them after five years. Um, again, if you have people who work on both sides of the fence, you're gonna wanna preserve all of your, your sampling and your, your exposure monitoring, your medical surveillance records for that 30 year period after employment. Don't get rid of them for some employees and have them for others. Uh, from, from a lawyer's perspective, that's just crazy making. Um, so uh, that's a, a real thing to watch. Now, on the respiratory protection, um, although MSHA says you can't use respiratory protection for compliance, there is a narrow subset where you do have to use it. And that's if you have an exposure uh, sample over 50 micrograms, starting with the next shift, everybody in that area has to wear respiratory protection until you have engineered out the problem or used administrative or work practice controls to bring it back down below 50. And so that's the one time that MSHA will allow you to use respiratory protection. And oh, by the way, they won't let you use worker rotation 
as one of the tools in your toolbox. So that is another way that this differs in, in substance from the OSHA rule. Um, but for the respiratory protection, they have replaced their old 1987 standard um, uh, that was incorporated by reference. And they have now incorporated by reference the ASTM F3387 2019 version. So if you are a contractor or if you are a mine operator, obviously, you're going to want to make sure that your respiratory protection program aligns with that. Um, and of course, if you're still doing work on the OSHA side of the fence, you're going to want to follow that also. Um, for underground mines, as I mentioned, I'm not going to talk about underground much from this point on. Um, they have approved ventilation plans. They have to submit them to the MSHA district manager. This has always been the rule. And now they're just roll rolling their silica controls into their coal dust uh, ventilation plan. Um, it deals with methane. It deals with you know other substances as well, has engineering controls. And MSHA reevaluates that plan every six months or more often if there's a substitute change at the mine. Maybe there's a mine collapse, they have to change the routing of the escape ways or uh, you know, they're hanging curtains differently now and they danger off an area, that is a change that affects airflow. So you would have to resubmit your plan. But um, we do have some a few coal mines in Maryland. We have a whole bunch of them that I've worked with up in Pennsylvania, which is part of our jurisdiction here and West Virginia. So uh, not a whole lot of coal mining in DC or Delaware, but um, you know, if you're affected by this and you need to know more about the coal rule, let me know. So uh, cost of the rule, real quick. Um, they do acknowledge that the costs of the rule have changed because of the longer phased in implementation, which I think is going to get rolled back. Um, the big one here, and again, totally different from the OSHA rule and totally different from sound industrial hygiene practice, I might add, MSHA's decided they will not allow you to use objective data. So all the sampling you're going to be doing of every task on their list, I'm going to give you the list in a second, Every three months, it's at in at you know it's it's in, in infinity because uh, you're never going to get below twenty five for most of these tasks, and there's no stopping point where you can say okay we've assessed this we know that we're going to be somewhere you know around thirty five micrograms we can't engineer it down below that so we're you know we can rely on our objective data. You can do that on the OSHA side, as long as it's kind of same area, same shift, same circumstances. Um, can't do that here. And the same thing, your historical samples, which a lot of companies anticipating this rule have kind of beefed up their sampling in the last couple of years. And part of that is in response to MSHA's uh, silica emphasis program, which I'll tell you about very quickly at the end. Uh, anyway, um, all of the, that body of sampling data that they've developed in anticipation of using that as objective data, they can't do it. And moreover, MSHA said they will only allow operators to, to utilize samples within the previous 12 months. Um, and that's effectively of that effective date. Um, that That's when they want you to start doing the baseline sampling. So of course you, you wanna continue doing sampling as good industrial hygiene practice now vis-a-vis the 100, which is enforceable, but start now trying to get things down as low as you can. Uh, but that's a huge change. Another huge change, and again, you don't have this on the OSHA side, is self-incrimination. Now, remember, MSHA is a strict liability statute. They have warrantless search authority, um, mandatory inspections. And now, if you have one of your own samples is above 50 micrograms, once this rule takes effect, you have to immediately notify MSHA. What does immediately mean? Beats the heck out of me. Um, that is one thing they did not clarify. I gave this presentation a couple of weeks ago in front of a couple of MSHA officials and I asked them, what does immediately mean? And they kind of ducked their heads and were like, ah, but, ah, but, ah, we can't speak on behalf of the agency. Okay. Um, I have a slide in here uh, that you'll all want to focus on, but at 1 p.m. today, at the MSHA headquarters in Arlington, Virginia, and also streaming, uh, they are doing their first stakeholder meeting on this. Now they've issued some frequently asked questions and I am gonna cover those here very quickly too. Um, and I expect that most of the stakeholder meeting will be reviewing those. 
I plan to try to be on there and I plan to ask the question formally, what does immediately mean? Because in the injury reporting context with MSHA, immediately is 15 minutes after you find out about it, which you know would be when you open up the envelope and get your sampling results. I don't think that they can possibly mean 15 minutes, but we really don't know what they mean. And it's self-incrimination. When you tell MSHA that you have had an overexposure, they will come, they will resample. If you're still above 50, they will cite you. And then you're going to be in a cycle where they're basically coming back every 15 days to see what you've done in terms of improvements with engineering controls. Um, they're doing this already under their emphasis program with the limit being 100. But you know, all indications are they're going to, to continue doing that uh, when, once the limit drops in half. Um, another thing, uh, you're now going to have to do periodic evaluations on the metal and non-metal side of your uh, controls every six months or more frequently if things change. You put in new controls, you do maintenance of equipment, et cetera. Uh, the, the limited use of respirators on the metal and non-metal side only, that's a new thing in the final rule. Um, and then the reporting of all metal and non-metal medical surveillance to NIOSH. Now, I, I will tell very quickly this story because um, this is under the current rule. I have a drilling company that I do work with and they hired two new workers. Uh, they sent them to get medical surveillance because that's what they do. And these guys had mostly been working at OSHA sites. They hadn't worked at any mines yet. And the next thing they knew, the OCDOC had sent their results to NIOSH and they both got letters telling them they were eligible for black lung benefits. Neither of them had ever worked at a coal mine. And fortunately they were honest and told my client, Long story short, I had to get the head of NIOSH, Dr. John Howard, involved. He got a re-review by the NIOSH panel with a work history, which the OCDOC had neglected to take. It was an OCDOC in coal country. And it's kind of, you know, if you see, see uh, uh, or you hear hoof prints, think horses and not zebras, he just assumed that these guys were drillers and blasters at coal operations. And they had a one slash zero opacity um, and they sent it along uh, up to NIOSH. Now, the key is the one guy had never worked in mining before, but he had worked in the grain industry. He did have a messed up chest x-ray, but it was due to grain dust inhalation. The other individual had been a truck driver and he was hauling asbestos containing material and he also had a bad chest X-ray. That part of it was correct, but he also had never worked at a mine. And so ultimately NIOSH rescinded the black lung benefits, but you know, MSHA has reserved on the issue of medical removal and we'll call it white lung benefits under the silica rule. But they did say reporting these results to NIOSH um, is being done in the meantime so that NIOSH will have that information for data and other purposes. And the other purposes, I think we can all uh, anticipate. So that's gonna be a huge change up. If you are a mine operator or you're a contractor who has an MSHA ID, you may be in a position of having to contribute to a black lung-like fund uh, supplementing workers' comp, uh, or you may need to notify workers' comp that there may be claims against them for uh, white lung benefits, pneumoconiosis, essentially, or silicosis. Um, because MSHA defines that as a one slash zero chest x-ray, even if the person is asymptomatic, you have to report that chest x-ray to MSHA within 10 days on a 7000-1 form online. Then that becomes publicly viewable um, on the MSHA data retrieval system. So again, if you're a contractor, you know, and you're doing long-term work at a mine, you may fall into that. Uh, whereas on the OSHA side of the medical surveillance, there is no reporting to NIOSH by the OCDOCs. That's a, again, huge shift there. So the main costs that MSHA has anticipated here are for exposure monitoring, uh, this constant, constant sampling that everybody's going to be doing. Uh, that's nearly 60% of the $89 million a year cost of the rule. 90% um, of which, by the way, is gonna be borne by the metal and non-metal sector. Um, medical surveillance is, is gonna be a huge hit. And again, most of that is on the metal and non-metal side because it's not a new thing for coal. It's not an added expense. Exposure controls, of course, respiratory protection, the ASTM standard implementation. But what's missing from that list? Um, 
you know, if I were in a live class, I'd be asking for hands here, but I'll tell you what it is, training. And yes, the rule is replete with training uh, requirements, but they're embedded in the preamble. And MSHA did something that's a little bit sneaky here. Uh, they said you have to train on silica as part of your part 46 and part 48 new minor training. You have to cover silica as part of newly employed experience minor training. You have to cover it in your task training. You have to cover it in site-specific hazard training for contractors, and you have to cover it in the annual refresher training. So they say, since you're already doing this training, there's no additional cost. Whoa, but you're still going to have cost, of course, because you're going to have to develop training materials and familiarity with this rule. And then you are adding this you know, in, into your training programs uh, in accordance with the compliance deadline, which may or may not be on the same cycle as your hire cycles and your annual refresher cycles. For those of you who are contractors and you are working with outside trainers, you know, like me or others, make sure your outside trainers are aware that they're going to have to embed, um, you know, make sure they read this Magnus, you know, 300 page silica rule so that they know what they need to do in terms of changing your silica training program or, or your, your MSHA training plans because those are going to have to be updated and then training, changing their curriculum. So that's pretty important. Um, we talked about the compliance deadlines already for the most part um, and why they were doing it relative to the sampling. Um, and the baseline sampling has to begin by the compliance deadline. So if that ends up sticking at April 8th, 2025 for the, uh, excuse me, 2026 for the metal and non-metal side, then you have to have done one set of samples by that date. Um, but you can't rely on that older sampling information. And that's really a pity. Um, I'm hoping that in the litigation, that will be something maybe that gets changed. Uh, I know it's going to be one of the things that, that I would likely be talking about because the group I'm working with has, you know, this is all they've been doing in the hope for their small operators who have five miners or less that they could build up this body of data. And, you know, that just got torpedoed. Um, the old rule I've already explained, I'm going to move on by that. Uh, well, actually, I'm not. I just want to point out on the health effects, the last bullet there, MSHA added a couple of things to the health effects that were uh, in the OSHA rule. And that also, even though, as I said, they sprinkled holy water on the health effects findings in the OSHA rule, the fact that they've added uh, chronic bronchitis to the list, they added pulmonary fibrosis to the list. Um, I don't even have that on there, but oh yeah, fi the fibrosis is on there. Um, that's another angle that potentially uh, the litigants may chip away at, you know, the efficacy of this. Um, there's no question we have had accelerated silicosis cases uh, exploding in the coal sector. And also to some extent, uh, you know, uh, in, in offshoots of this in the dimension stone, the, the countertop finishing and all of that. Um, and part of it on the coal side is they are using long wall, you know, continuous mining machines that are scraping not only the coal vein, but also the rock in which it's embedded. So that's generating, I'll call it a witch's brew of silica and coal dust, which do have a bad synergistic effect. Um, and so they found actually in an IOS study that there were more cases of silicosis in the 20, you know, 10 decade than there had been in the 1990s. Um, and 30% of coal workers who have been diagnosed with pneumoconiosis reported that they considered suicide in the previous year, according to a West Virginia University study. So, you know, MSHA is taking this very seriously. We need to take it seriously. I agree with the exposure limit being changed. You know, I just wish to heck that they had adopted a table one because then there would really be no problem implementing this. Um, you know, there would be more challenges because of the strict liability. Uh, but, you know, this has been a rule that for the, the most part, the construction groups, even as we call it five guys in a truck, have been able to deal with because of table one being a turnkey approach to it. And lacking that and lacking the ability to use respiratory protection and worker rotation is going to take tasks that you're already doing successfully on the OSHA side and make them very different in the way you're going to have to do them on the MSHA side of the fence.
Um, these are the codes. Um, you can look this up later, uh, so we don't need to look at it now. And I do want to stress here out of this slide that in 2020, when the inspector general um, was uh, chastising MSHA for dragging their feet on doing a silica rule, they pointed out that the 50 microgram level that OSHA had just adopted wasn't even guaranteed to be safe. It was just simply the lowest feasible limit that could be adopted. And MSHA is doing the same. But, you know, understand, boys and girls, uh, that doesn't mean that you're totally protected. Um, and the more studies that are out there, obviously, you know, the more data points that we're going to have, you know, that may be showing that exposure even at levels below that can be injurious. The problem is we just can't engineer it out effectively and consistently below 50 micrograms uh, on either side of the fence. Um, the problem, in fact, with table one was that OSHA said these 18 tasks and types of equipment, we, OSHA, have determined it is not feasible to consistently be below 50, even with all available tools. And so we're not going to make you sample. We're not going to make you waste money getting overexposure after overexposure. As long as you do all of these things, the manufacturers, you know, maintenance, changing the filters, um, you know, they allow worker rotation, uh, there are other work practices for different tasks that they recommended, and then they specify the PPE, the respirator to use. And in some cases, if you're doing it outdoors less than four hours, you don't need to wear one. And if you're doing it indoors, you have to wear an APF 10 or an APF 15 or an APF 25, depending on the task. But boom, you're fine. You don't have to do sampling. You can't do any of that under the MSHA rule simply because the worker rotation and the use of respirators for compliance is not going to be allowed. So that is really the problematic part of this rule. So we've talked about most of these things already. Uh, we do have a poll question here. Does your company have in-house industrial hygiene support for conducting periodic silica sampling? In other words, are you gonna be able to handle this internally or are you gonna be having to go outside you know, to uh, 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 industrial hygiene consultants who are about to become very, very rich? So I'm I'm interested in seeing uh, the the answers to that one, and uh, you know we've basically gone through these the sampling regimen without the ability to build up a body of of objective data and then stop at some point, uh, which you can under the OSHA rule, uh, the, the OSHA general industry rule I should say OSHA rule construction you don't have to sample at all, um, as long as you're following Table One. Um, you know, all of these things. Uh, another that I didn't mention, um, MSHA will use its own samples to determine if you are out of compliance. But your self-reporting of your own overexposures, A, is going to be a tripwire for them coming in. B, they can cite you uh, if they find that there were controls that aren't being maintained. So it gets them in there. They may find that your training wasn't adequate. They'll look at the whole shebang. Um, but the bottom line is they can't cite you on your own overexposure because you may have screwed up your sampling. You know, it may have fallen off somebody and dragged in the dirt and you didn't know it. Um, and they have the burden of proving that it was an overexposure. What they are doing, and, and I have a, a case right now, I'm still trying to land the plane on this one. Um, they cited my client when MSHA had an overexposure, they asked them for their internal historical sampling data. And this company had done a lot of sampling. And out of about 50 samples they had done, there were three overexposures, one in 2013, one in 2016, and one in 2020. And they used those to say there was a pattern or practice of overexposures, and they made it an unwarrantable failure, which is MSHA's worst. That's like an, a, a willful OSHA violation. And they actually proposed going personal after the corporate safety director. And he wasn't even working there until 2021. Um, MSHA also has a five-year statute of limitations versus OSHA's 180 days. So that allows them to go back and look at your sampling results, medical surveillance reports, uh, including chest x-rays, and they are exempt from HIPAA. So if they see that you had chest x-rays that were a one slash zero uh, or worse, and you didn't report it, as, as a case of silicosis to them, they have up to five years to cite you for that. Um, you know, they, they have a lot of power. Um, they have the right to go through health records. 
that has been litigated and MSHA won. Um, so there's a lot of issues here uh, to be considered. And medical removal is going to be especially challenging uh, because uh, it's going to be a permanent total disability. Um, if they decide you have silicosis, you can't work in any other silica exposing field. Uh, now we have uh, the results of our poll and 80% said that they did not have in-house uh, IH support. So, you know, again, hopefully we will be doing some training through Chesapeake Region Safety Council. You know, I'm prepared to assist with that and help identify sampling strategies and ways that you can align the OSHA and the MSHA rules together. You know, that, that'll be on our dance card, but, you know, probably in 2025, I would imagine, um, if we're able to, to, to go forward and do that. Um, these are the 11 occupational categories uh, that uh, MSHA has set up. And, uh, you know, many contractors will fall into this, you know, not all of them, obviously. Uh, but if you're a specialty contractor, you know, you could be involved uh, with doing the electrical work, the mechanical work. Uh, you might not be involved with the packaging and the bagging. Uh, stone cutting operations is one uh, of the uh, task. Truck loading, and they are very attuned to truck driver uh, visiting uh, trucker safety and health. And so even if you are, you know, picking up material and moving it around in the mine or taking it off site for customers and cycling back through, you may end up in the crosshairs here. You will be on the the, the second rule I'm still going to talk about today, uh, which is their powered haulage, uh, or excuse me, the surface mobile equipment rule that everybody is calling the powered haulage rule, but I'll explain why in a, in a few minutes. Um, and, and that one, you know, if you bring any equipment onto the mine site, even your over the road pickup truck, prepared to have your parking brakes tested, prepared to fail that test and prepare to be cited. Um, I have one mine that had 11 contractors cited in one day for parking brake violations. And it, yes, it was a setup kind of akin to the cop behind the billboard. So we'll talk about that in a little bit here. Um, going back though, to the silica rule, um, these 11 categories, uh, conveyor belts, um, you also have crushing equipment, Portable plants are covered by this. Um, I know somebody out there is probably wondering about that. And yes, you are going to have unique problems uh, that are going to make you go crazy, but you are covered under this just like contractors are. Your kilns at the cement plants are covered by this, you know, uh, leaching and pelletizer at my gold and silver mines that I deal with. Um, and then you're getting into some real contractor stuff, the large powered haulage equipment. If you're operating haul trucks, front end loaders, bulldozers, scalers at a mine as a contractor, you're going to be covered. Um, you know, and of course, if you're doing this with your own personnel, you're covered too. Um, your outside uh, smaller equipment, bobcat operators, forklifts, crane operators, you know, um, aerial lift operators, uh, all of those powered industrial trucks, uh, your drillers, and then they just have a catch-all category for miners and other occupations, everything from welders to dragline operators and barge operators and those applying shotcrete uh, in underground mines. So um, this is, though, the 11 categories. So if you have workers in any of these tasks and you they are expected to have exposure above 25 micrograms, which is the action level, you are going to have to sample them every three months as long as they are above 25. If they are above 50, then you're going to have to report those samples to MSHA. If they're between 25 and 50, you have to keep implementing engineering controls over and over and over and over and over. And you have to keep a log of those. And I'll, I'll show you that slide next. Now, what about representative sampling? Yes, you can do representative sampling, the same task, same shift, and the same work area. So all three of those have to be in alignment. Um, but beyond that, they have parts of this rule that also suggest you might have to sample everybody who would be in that classification. Um, I'm hoping they will clarify things a little bit more coming up here. So I've already explained this. And if you do get a sample that is below 25, yay, you can't take them out of your program just yet. Then you have to do a second sample. And if you have two in a row that are below 25, then that task, that position can be removed from your silica program, just like, like with OSHA, that part is the same. Um, 
But be careful because if, if you remove somebody and MSHA sees them looking like they were dipped in powdered sugar and decides to hang a pump on them and they come in at 40, you're not going to be cited for an overexposure, but you're going to be cited for not doing sampling on them. So there are so many different elements. You saw that when I showed you the, the Code of Federal Regulations uh, subsections. Uh, MSHA does not group citations like OSHA does. Each one gets a separate penalty. There are certain mandatory minimum penalties depending on the classification uh, of the violation as well. Um, if you are above 50, you have to immediately notify MSHA, whatever the heck that means, and you have to implement corrective actions and continue sampling every time you do some corrections, fine tuning it, okay, hand another, hang another pump, get the results back, okay, we're still above 50, what are we going to do next? They have to wear respirators. Uh, every miner uh, in that area and, and contract workers are considered miners, uh, have to wear it for the full shift or during any periods of overexposures if they're in you know, multiple areas um, until you can verify that you are below the permissible exposure limit of 50. Um, you also have to keep records of your corrective actions um, and your exposure uh, results. Um, the evaluation of your program that has to be posted on the mine bulletin board for 31 days. And you have to repeat that at least every six months. We talked about that. Um, when you do your uh, sampling, the sample results have to be posted on the mine bulletin board for 31 days. They can be available electronically uh, as well if everybody has access. And as I mentioned, uh, they are specifying the sampling results. Uh, for sampling, you have to use the ISO 7708 1995 version sampler. And for the analytical uh, method, it has to be the ISO 17025. Make sure your labs are able to do that. Um, we already kind of talked about all of this, uh, that you have to report the overexposures to MSHA, put everybody in a respirator by the start of the next work shift, make sure they continue wearing them. They have to be at least 100 series. So they have to be a NIOSH approved air purifying respirator. None of these paper and 95 dust masks anymore. Um, and then you have to keep the records of all of this for five years. You also have to log your corrective actions the actions taken, the respirator used during that period, and the dates. Those records have to be maintained. Those records have to be uh, available to MSHA and to your miners as well. Uh, for compliance, you have engineering controls as the primary. I mean, uh, el elimination or product substitution, obviously, are above those on the hierarchy, but you can't actually substitute the product you're mining. Um, so engineering controls... Um, and then administrative controls as a supplement. Uh, but what they consider engineering controls, that, that's textbook IH, ventilation controls, dust suppression, enclosed cabs or control booths with filtered air. Um, you know, water is, is a dust suppression uh, approach as well that is allowed. Um, and you can change how you do material handling. We've talked about this a lot in the, the uh, OSHA training I've done uh, for, for Chesapeake Region Safety Council, you know, putting the, the mortar powder in the bucket very carefully, you know, with the, the opening of the bag contained in the bucket get that out. There's no dust. Now you're pouring the water in rather than having a, a bucket full of water or taking the bag and shaking it where it's all up in your breathing zone. Those are really no cost solutions. And you, you know, what you can do that's, that's free or cheap, you obviously want to do. Engine, uh, administrative controls, housekeeping, and again, you know, we're going to be looking at not doing dry sweeping and you, following the same kind of housekeeping protocols you do on the OSHA side. Uh, positioning of miners uh, outside of, you know, don't have people crushing, you know, recycled pavement upstream from where your people are working, or upwind, I should say, from, from where your people are working downwind, um, cleaning up spills promptly, clothing contamination, make sure clothing is cleaned off. You can put plastic covers on the seats and mobile equipment, and those can be wiped down between shift changes that, that, uh, eliminates cross-contamination, but they have specifically banned rotation of workers as an administrative control. 
Now, the, the uh, medical surveillance, I've talked about this already. The exam is voluntary, but it has to be offered every five years. And each new minor has to get the medical exam within 30 days of employment um, and then follow up uh, within three years. They are not doing what OSHA did, which was 30 days of respirator use, duh, because they're not allowing the use of respirators. Um, and then, as in the OSHA rule, the, the OCDOCs will only provide the employer with information that the date of the medical exam, that it meets the provisions of the standard, and if they did the medical evaluation for wearing a respirator, whether the person can wear the respirator or not. Um, now, if the minor uh, or employee signs the waiver saying that they can release all of the information to the employer, then they will do it. So this complicates your duty to notify MSHA if a minor has a one slash zero chest x-ray or worse as read by an ILO certified B reader, because you may not get a report of that. What happens? Well, if you don't know, you don't know and you can't tell. Um, so just as with the OSHA rule, I'm recommending for your existing employees, you know, make signing that waiver a term and condition of employment, unless you're union and then you're going to negotiate that. Okay. Uh, but give them a gift card, you know, 10, 15, 20 bucks or something as consideration for that change in terms and conditions. That way, you know what is going on in your operation. And for newer hires, you can just build that into your manual in advance of their hiring um, and make that a, you know, if they don't like that, they can go work someplace else. Um, but you really do need to know what's going on since you're paying for these exams anyway. Um, the record keeping, I mentioned that earlier. Um, you have to keep the medical evaluation records for the period, excuse me, for five years. And why is that? That's because MSHA has a five-year statute of limitation. Sampling records, five years from the sampling date. Corrective actions, five years from the date of each corrective action. So you might start corrections in September. You might finish them the following January. It's going to be five years you know, dating from that last corrective action on that particular issue. Um, written determinations from the doctor, period of employment plus six months. That's the one that differs from OSHA um, and, and re medical opinion records, period of employment plus six months. So again, you're going to be wanting to keep records, in my view, if you are both under OSHA and MSHA and you have mix and match employees, keep them for the duration required under the OSHA standard it's just going to be a whole lot simpler for you in the long run. Trust me, I'm a lawyer. Um, now, portable operations, as I mentioned, uh, these portable plants are very often brought in uh, to crush small amounts of material and then leave a stockpile for sale. Um, you know, uh, sometimes they're used for recycled material. That should be under OSHA, but I have had cases, including one we litigated, where uh, MSHA was found to have jurisdiction because in MSHA's view, they were mixing some virgin limestone in with the recycled pavement. If you're doing anything like that at your operations, uh, stop it, <laughs> because it is going to bring MSHA in and it's going to really mess you up. Um, but with portable plants, they move around a lot. They might only be in one location for a week at a time. And if they move to a different site before the second time that you're doing your, your sampling within three months, then you have to do the, the follow-up sample at the next site. Is this apples and oranges? You betcha. Um, one of them might be out in the, the middle of the Mojave Desert where you have you know sand blowing you know, and, and sand blasting your face. And the next one, they might be in a, a forested area you know, where there's very limited uh, ambient silica in the environment um, or vice versa. Um, you also, as a portable plant, have to immediately report your overexposures to MSHA. And I know this is what a lot of contractors are doing, is operating these portables. Um, you also have to make sure that respirators are going to be worn before the start of the next shift. And then you're going to have to keep wearing them and resample when you move to the new site until you get those results back and make sure that you're below 50 again. Um, and then you also are going to have to do a qualitative evaluation every six months. Uh, for contractors, um, MSHA says part 45 contractors must comply with the rules. They use drillers and blasters as an example. And then they say for other contractors, production operators, such your customers, 
may comply with this, you know, uh, depending upon the services provided that they could help you out with this. Uh, don't expect that for starters, you know, that they're going to be your industrial hygiene department. Your customers are not going to be your industrial hygiene department. But also, Part 45 contractors sounds like they're really limiting this, but they aren't. Uh, there is a definition of Part 45 contractors um, where they list those who have to get MSHA training before they can bid on a job or, or begin work on a job. And there's nine categories of those. But for anybody else, if MSHA is going to issue you a citation, they will issue you an MSHA contractor ID at that time. And abracadabra, you have now become a Part 45 contractor, even if you might just be an electrical contractor, for example. So in the program policy manual, this is the nine absolute categories of Part 45 contractors. If you're doing any of this stuff, you know, you're doing mine development work, shaft or slope sinking, construction of mine facilities. Yep, you betcha, you're in there. Uh, building additional uh, additions on existing facilities, demolition work, constructing dams, excavation or earth moving, you know, uh, equipment installation, um, equipment service. Yeah, they're getting the Caterpillar and the Balbo and, and the uh, Camazzo, uh representatives in here as well. They have to have IDs and they're covered by this rule now. Uh, material handling within the mine. So if you're moving stuff from a pit area over to a processing area, but you're not taking it off site for the mine operator, you are covered by this. Whereas if you're just getting the truck loaded and then you're adiosing out the gate to, to take it off to parts unknown, you are not considered a part 45 contractor unless you're cited and given a part 45 ID. And then finally drilling and blasting. So those are the ones who are pr uh, primarily going to be impacted by this rule. Um, MSHA has issued FAQs here. Um, uh, these just came out and uh, clarifications. One of the things I didn't mention before is the OSHA rule excludes the sorptive minerals uh, from its OSHA silica rule. MSHA specifically includes sorptive minerals in there. Um, it also covers all three forms of restorable crystal and silica alone or in combination. So that's quartz, quartz uh, cristobalite and uh, tritomite. Um, it also establishes uh, that uniform 50 microgram level and the 25 uh, action level, eight hour time weighted average, a um, few things on coal in there. Um, now, interestingly, they clarify in their FAQ that they consider enclosed cabs or control booths with filtered breathing air as an engineering control, but to get credit for it, they must be properly maintained. So if they show up and your guy has his door hanging open and he's smoking a cigarette, you're going to get cited uh, in all likelihood. Um, and they can continue working after uh, you you're above 25, but they are going to uh, you know, expect you to continue sampling forever um, uh, every three months in those job occupation or classifications. Um, the periodic evaluation has to be done every six months or when there are changes. We talked about the posting um, for, for the 31 days. And if you have an extended work shift, say 10 hours, then you're going to collect the dust sample for the entire 10 hours. And when you resample, it does not have to be the same individual. If you have Larry, Moe, and Curly all doing the same task and Larry was circled initially, you can sample, you know, Moe or Curly as long as they are doing the same task. But when you resample, you have to do at least two people. This gets crazy, doesn't it? Um, but but it is uh, pretty complicated. Um, there's also the ongoing enforcement initiative, um, which mostly is affecting the uh, the actual production operators. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to pass over that because we have a few minutes before we go to questions. I just want to note that um, this does have the four components to it, inspections by MSHA, sampling by MSHA, compliance assistance, and miners' rights. But they're asking operators when they show up to do these spot inspections for five years of their internal sampling data, as well as all the health information, copies of their respiratory protection program, copies of their occupational health program, if they have one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then if they do find that you have an overexposure, this is no BS. They are sending an inspector back to resample every 15 days. 
and they're doing sometimes they're showing up on the night shift when they were there before on the day shift. Um, they are driving a few of my customers, my clients, crazy. They have had some of their operations in part shut down for two to three months over this stuff. So um, that this is a bit of a uh, harbinger of things to come really is quite frightening. Uh, you do not have that level of oversight with OSHA. OSHA can get around to every work site under its jurisdiction once every 182 years. And MSHA comes to see you twice a year, whether you need it or not, at a minimum, four times a year underground. Um, so uh, there's also the miners' rights component, and they are talking to your miners about their right to refuse work if they think that there's a, an overexposure. Um, they are uh, also uh, reminding them about their right to make uh, hazard complaints to MSHA. Um, and their protections under Section 105C of the Mine Act, uh, which is very aggressively enforced uh, by MSHA and can carry a penalty up to 88 grand in, on top of make whole relief um, like you would have under Section 11C for uh, OSHA. The other thing is it's a 60-day statute of limitations for whistleblower complaints with MSHA versus uh, uh, 30 days under the OSHA. So if you have people working at both OSHA and MSHA sites for you, and they blow the statute of limitations on OSHA, don't be surprised if they file under MSHA because they are being cornered by, by MSHA during the inspections and being kind of read their rights by the inspector. Um, the most exposed people on the metal and non-metal side, stone cutters, crusher operators, and baggers. Uh, for coal, it's machine operators, uh, high wall drillers, and roof bolters. And again, we've talked about, you know, it's the same with everything, air, water, you know, and barricades. Those are your main controls. Uh, but the difference is because you don't have worker rotation, once you hit that maximum of 50, which might be in four hours performing a task, that task stops for the day. You can't bring another person in to take over at that point. That is really what the ban on worker rotation means. So it's a big deal. Um, this does not mirror OSHA requirements even a little bit, as you have seen. And table one is not an option for you, even if you are a contractor, uh, because you can't use the worker rotation and the PPE tools out of that. Um, you're gonna be under heightened scrutiny. You cannot rely on objective data or older samples. You are gonna be in this loop of continuous sampling in all likelihood for up to 11 positions. So um, figure, you know, that's at a minimum 33 samples every three months that you're gonna be taking. That, that's a lot of change there. Um, remember, you're going to have reporting requirements to MSHA if you are told by the healthcare practitioner that they've uh, they've had a one slash zero chest X-ray on one of your workers. Um, worry a little bit about workers with long COVID because if they have that broken glass look in their lungs from long COVID, it is going to masquerade a silicosis. And you're in all likelihood going to have to file a report with MSHA, and that is going to go to NIOSH, which may or may not be classified correctly uh, based upon my experience there. Um, you know, how's MSHA going to deal with uh, any legal challenges, asking them to make all of the compliance dates April of 2025? That remains to be seen. So do be proactive. Don't wait. Uh, for the rule to take effect. Now, very, very quickly, um, if uh, Kim will uh, allow me, uh, oh, I also wanted to show you, this is the information for today's MSHA stakeholders meeting. Um, if you feel, if you're in the Arlington area and you decide you want to show up and comment on this at all, uh, give them some feedback face-to-face, -face, you can do that peacefully, peacefully. Um, and if you want to go on their uh, Zoom link, which is where I'm going to be, um, that information is there as well. So um, hope to see some of you there. Um, now, I also very quickly was going to talk about the MSHA surface mobile equipment rule. Um, and then we will turn to some questions on both of these. Yeah, this please rule, do, Adele. Take, yes. give, give us a few minutes on this. You're good. Go ahead and yeah. go ahead. And go okay. Ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for that input. Uh, first of all, uh, the final mobile equipment rule came out December 20th, 2023, and it took effect technically in January, but the real rubber meets the road, no pun intended, enforcement of this starts next week, July 17th. There has been no litigation over this. There is not going to be, you know, a, a comet coming down from the Supreme Court to kill this rule. Um, so this is in effect, and it covers mine operators and also Part 45 contractors, same definitions that I used on the earlier slide. 
what you have to do is establish a written program for mobile equipment and powered haulage equipment, but they have eliminated belt conveyors uh, from this. So um, it is going to apply uh, to a lot of your equipment, but not belt conveyors. It applies to all equipment that you are using at surface mines or at surface areas of underground mines. But they have clarified, if you have, say, a, a, a front end loader that you use underground and you just bring it to the surface for servicing, that would not be included as long as you're not also using it at the mine for production purposes. Um, in this program, which has to be in writing, I'll mention that a second time, and probably a third or fourth, um, you have to assess the hazards and the risks and identify the actions to reduce accidents related to surface mobile equipment. Why is that? Well, because 50% of fatalities at mines are mobile equipment and powered haulage related. That's why they, they put this new rule out. Um, you know, uh, they've had an enforcement program going on for two years on this one as well. I'm going to show that to you very quickly at the very end. Um, you also have to develop and implement a safety program that is best suited to your mining conditions and operations. So it's not supposed to be a one size fits all approach. But having said that, MSHA has put a, multi a, a number, I wouldn't say a multitude, but they put a number of templates on their uh, website under this rule. Um, and some of those have been donated by the National Stone, Sand and Gravel Association. And uh, I think the Portland Cement Association turned one in. Um, and then MSHA has one of its own design that's up there. Um, and you can look at those uh, again, in the interest of time, if I was if I was doing my two hour version of this one, I'd be showing you the templates um, and talking you through it. But the level of detail is all over the place. And I have a couple of clients that have sent me their programs in advance of this deadline to look at. And some of them are listing every single VIN number and and you know unit of mobile equipment that is covered on their plan. And they've gone through looking up the manufacturer's handbook specifications on when you replace the seat belt and when you replace the, uh, the air filters and when you change the oil and when you change the wiper blades and you get, my, you know, when you rotate the tires and you get my drift. And some of them are simply saying, we have front end loaders and we're going to change the air filters in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications and we're going to blah, blah, blah. So my recommendation is dumb it down. The more specific you get in this, the more you're binding yourself because this becomes an effect, uh, an enforceable rule for you in effect. Um, expect also that MSHA is going to be focusing on task training of your equipment operators. They're already doing this. They have a few trick questions, one of which is asking them about emergency steering. And a lot of the equipment calls it secondary steering. And if they go, huh? they say your task training was inadequate. The other one is they're stopping equipment operators. You know, maybe they'll, they'll pull up to a driller and say, what's the maximum grade that this equipment allows you to drill on, to, to operate on? And if they, again, say beats the heck out of me, you're gonna get a task training citation. And remember, it's not uniform um, with, with this equipment. I'm, I'm involved in a case right now and, you know, some of them have ranges on grade, you know, from, you know, 20, 25% is optimal. And then you're looking at rolling resistance and doing calculations. This is not, you know, an off the cuff answer. Sometimes you make sure that you are covering this, um, especially if you are a contractor who is bringing mobile equipment onto a customer mine operator's work site. Um, they're also looking at site specific training um, for visiting drivers, including those who are just getting loaded and, and going off site, especially relative to fall protection. How are you tarping your load? How are you closing your hatches? Is there a safe rack system? How have you been trained to use the safe rack system? What signage does the mine operator have? Does it tell you about the need to chalk uh, your equipment if it is on a grade? Um, are you aware that even if it is automatic and it's in park and you have a functional parking brake set and you're on a 1% grade, you still have to have your equipment chalked? These are all the things that they are looking at uh, already under their enhanced enforcement program. And it is going to be on steroids starting next week because all of this has to be addressed um, as well in your written program. Um, the purpose of the standard is to promote a positive safety culture. Uh, um, and I will note that not only, 
you know, our, our uh, mobile equipment uh, fatalities and powered haulage about 50% of the fatalities, but half of those, you know, are, are contractors. I mean, they're disproportionately represented in fatalities compared to their man hours in the mining workforce. Um, all part production operators and part 45 independent contractors have to have that written program. And I told you where it applies. Now, what is covered? Wheeled equipment, skid mounted equipment, track mounted equipment, and rail mounted equipment. So, um, you know, I do have clients that have rail switching yards. Um, they have, you know, equipment that is used to pull some of the cars and, and uh, you know, load some of the cars, tip some of the cars. Um, all of that is going to be covered. It has to be included in the program. And then powered haulage that moves people, equipment, or materials. Your off-road and your on-road equipment, the over-the-road pickup trucks that your supervisor gets as a benefit of the job. He drives it home. He uses it grocery shopping, and then he drives it into the mine and goes to, to, to check on somebody in a work area. That is subject to inclusion in the rule. Um, you know, obviously things that you rent are going to be included if they're on your site. Your rented cranes, your rented aerial lifts, your rented forklifts. Um, they do exclude belt conveyors and they exclude manually powered tools. So you don't have to include your wheelbarrows or, or your hand, you know, your, your hand trucks, your dollies in there. And they've specifically excluded welding carts and the oxygen acetylene, you know, and other gas carts, uh, because typically those are rolled, but you're pulling them. They're not um, mechanically powered. Uh, so that's essentially the parameters of what is covered by the rule. Um, it applies to all operations, regardless of the number of employees you have. And this was a change up. Their, their proposed rule had envisioned exempting mine sites that had uh, less than five workers, you know, and that would have applied to your contractors, presumably as well. Uh, but they did not include that in the final rule. Um, again, contract uh, conveyors are out of the rule, but that they were out of the rule in the proposed stage. Um, everybody has to have that written program. And one of the things in there, you have to, of course, take action to reduce site-specific risks, but you have to include the maintenance procedures and schedules in your program for your mobile equipment. And that's where, if it's different for Volvo than it is for your CAT equipment, which is different from your Grove crane, um, you are going to have to get somewhat equipment specific on that. Um, they also have a, a fairly bizarre requirement in here that you have to identify currently available and emerging feasible technologies to improve the safety of mobile equipment, but you don't have to adopt them. But you have to be able to show to MSHA during an inspection, I went to a trade show like Con Ag or Con Expo. Um, I talked to my friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer, or I sat through a presentation of theirs online. Um, you know, I went to a meeting of, you know, the Maryland Transportation and Building Materials Association, and I talked to some of their associate members. Um, and if you can't show that you did that, that's technically a violation. Um, if you do adopt a new technology, is that considered a, a defect affecting safety if it goes on the fritz? And the answer is maybe. MSHA has said you don't have to put them on, but if they're on, you need to maintain them unless there is an alternative, for example, backup cameras, but you still have your side and your rear view mirrors that are unimpeded. Uh, the problem is your operators may come to rely on backup cameras, much like we do in our personal vehicles. And if an accident occurs, like they run over back over a coworker and the backup camera wasn't working and they were relying on their mirrors, but they didn't really use them properly, uh, then you probably would get cited as a defect affecting safety for not maintaining that, that uh, aftermarket technology, we'll call it. Um, you also have to train your miners and other persons, including visiting contractors, um, about this rule um, and the, the things they need necessary to perform the rule, uh, excuse me, to perform the work safely. Um, there's another thing here. Yeah, there is. Uh, responsible person. They're not calling it a competent person. They're calling it a responsible person. Has to review the written program at least annually or more often if there are changes. Maybe midway through the year, you bring in some new equipment from a new operate, a new manufacturer. That would be a change that would cause that program to have to be re-reviewed. 
Um, you have to consult with your minors and their representatives in developing your program. So you can't have somebody uh, sitting on, in a corporate office on high writing a program in, a, in an ivory tower and then sending it down to your company for implementation. Um, the program can be hard copy or electronic, but you have to make it available to MSHA upon request. And if you're, you're having a power outage in Houston and MSHA shows up anyway and you can't get online, you're screwed. You're going to get cited. Um, so keep a paper copy available. Um, remember, the responsible person has to have the necessary knowledge and experience about mining equipment and conditions and processes to responsibly evaluate and update the program. You can have more than one responsible person, and they don't have to be assigned full time at that mine. They can be assigned over multiple mines, but they will be considered an agent of management for purposes of Section 110 uh, liability. 110C liability is civil. That is a penalty from MSHA of up to $88,000 per person in addition to the company penalty. And then if they say there, somebody did get backed over and your program did not provide for maintaining your backup cameras, let's use that as an example, you could be uh, criminally prosecuted under Section 110D of the Mine Act. And actually MSHA does not even require there to be an injury for them to criminally prosecute a responsible person. So I like to call those individuals the DF or the designated felon. Um, you know, you, if you're taking that title, man and woman, <laughs> be responsible about it. You know, that's right in your name and they will hold you responsible under the law. Um, contractors that are part 45 contractors, remember that nine categories, um, you're expected to create and implement your own program the host operator can integrate your program into their own if they wish. I have not met a single one of my mine operator clients that wants to do that for a contractor because of the liability exposure. So, um, you know, expect that you're going to have to have your own program um, and what needs to be in it. Um, you have to show what actions you're going to take to identify and analyze hazards, uh, reduce the risks associated. That might be using a job hazard analysis. That, duh, that's easy. Uh, reviewing the handbooks, you know, watching training videos from the from the manufacturer. Um, develop and maintain procedures and schedules for both routine and non-routine maintenance and repairs. The big one on this, uh, I, I'm reasonably sure Caterpillar still has in their materials that seat belts should be replaced every five years. And this is one, one that MSHA has been dodging a little bit when I've run into them since this rule came out. Will they cite you if the seat belt wasn't replaced in the last five years? They say no, but if the seat belt failed um, and it hadn't been replaced, then yes, you know, uh, and they could cite you already for uh, on one level for not having a functional seatbelt, but they could cite you separately potentially then under this written program thing. So the, MSHA is big on doing double and triple dipping, which OSHA is not. Uh, OSHA's field operations manual typically says, you know, group citations that are all under one standard, you know, unless there's been egregious behavior. You know, and they do have that right to decouple them under the OSHA instance by instance program that's currently uh, in process. But uh, for the most part, they don't do that. Uh, MSHA never groups. I had them go through where fire extinguishers hadn't been inspected uh, that month. They wrote 35 separate citations with separate penalties for fire extinguishers. So that gives you an idea where MSHA may be going with this. Um, as I mentioned, um, you also, in your written program, have to identify the emergent technology. Um, you're going to be documenting your training, and that will be documented on a 5000-23 form uh, under Part 46 and Part 48. Um, and then, you know, again, eliciting uh, input from your minors and their representatives, making the program available to MSHA and, and to your minors and representatives, and providing copies upon request. So, um, the non-routine things, we've talked about most of this, I think, already. Um, if you already have a maintenance schedule, there's nothing that says you have to go back and recreate the wheel, you know, just integrate that into your programs. But make sure that it does align with what the manufacturer says that you should be doing. Um, and in terms of the identifying the technologies, MSHA says you can, again, de demonstrate compliance by attending industry meetings, 
or NIOSH meetings or MSHA meetings when they do spring thaws. I mean, granted, you know, we'll be rolling around to that next spring, but uh, those are good opportunities. Uh, you know, sometimes there are, uh, in fact, the Chesapeake Region Safety Council, you know, has a, a conference coming up in September and they always have vendors. Uh, the fact that it's a safety feature on equipment that's used on the OSHA side of the fence, that equipment may well be used on the MSHA side. That might suffice as well. So visit the vendors if you go uh, to the uh, September 26th uh, uh, annual safety conference. Um, and again, you can speak to vendors directly to get more information too. Um, the contractors have the same obligations as production operators. They expect you're going to have your own program. It can be integrated, but don't expect that to, to occur. But the bottom one is really the importance on this slide is coordinating and communicating between the host employer and the contractor on your respective programs. So everybody is on the same page as to what is required, what has been done, what is needed for safety. Um, finally, the uh, Powered Haulage Enhanced Enforcement Program is going on right now and will continue. They're not ending this just because the new rule is taking effect next week. Um, what they have done is really targeted customer and contract truck drivers, as well as uh, you know others performing uh, work with powered haulage and, and mobile equipment. Um, and this is not limited to surface, by the way. This one, they are enforcing underground as well. Um, but what they've done, in addition to the training standards I've already mentioned, the task training, the new minor training site specific hazard training, they they pulled out five MSHA metal and non-metal standards for special emphasis. And they've said, if you're cited under one of these, you're not gonna get the regular assessed penalty. They're going to look at it at headquarters for special assessment. If it's checked off as a 104D unwarrantable failure, um, if it's reasonably likely to be uh, at least permanently disabling or fatal on the checkoffs, and if it's high negligence or reckless disregard, then it can be considered a flagrant violation, and that's where it can go up to $324,000. Um, otherwise, the maximum penalty uh, would be $88,000 against the company, and then $88,000 against individual agents. The five standards are control of equipment, or, or more specifically, failure to contain, uh, uh, control equipment. If you overturn a, a, one of your trucks on a haul road, you're going to get cited for that. If you run through the berms, you're going to get cited for that. Um, if you run over somebody or you hit a building, you're going to get cited for that. Um, the next is use of seatbelts. And they have said, if it is an agent of management who is caught not wearing the seatbelt, they will write that as an unwarrantable failure and they will do a special investigation and do a personal penalty under section 110. Believe them, I have handled probably two dozen of those cases in my career. Uh, chalking of wheels, again, um, if you are parked on a 1% grade or more, you've got to have chocks under the wheels or you can turn the wheels into the rib or if there is a, a gully kind of dug out that you can put the wheels into so that it won't roll, that's allowed as well. But they cite contractors an awful lot under that one. Pre-operational inspection. If there are defects affecting safety, the equipment needs to be taken out of service and tagged out. And then a report needs to be made of those defects and maintained that that report has to be kept until the defects are corrected. Then you can dispose of it. Uh, but if you have one of those you know, CDL type inspection books in your, your uh, cab, and you have three months worth of inspections in there, MSHA will look through all of that. And if they see three months ago, day one, brakes feel a little soft. Day two, brakes are getting worse. Day three, had to drag my feet to stop the truck. And then on the fourth day, the brakes are, are, are corrected. And their, their production records showing that that equipment was operated back three months ago with that equipment defect they can cite you for that. Remember that five-year statute of limitations. I've had that exact case. So I'm not blowing smoke here. Um, you know, Don't keep records in your cab and make them available if they are not mandatory records. But if they're there and MSHA asks to see them, you can't deny them because of that warrantless search authority. Um, so just be careful with this one. And then the brakes, service brakes, as well as parking brakes. Um, I will say, if you look under this uh, standard for, for service brakes, they delineate how those are to be tested, and it's based on the weight of the vehicle 
and the speed of the vehicle. And then basically I'm just supposed to say, stop, you put the brakes on, and then they're supposed to measure how many feet it took to stop it and match that against the chart. Nobody does this. Nobody puts MSHA through their test. If, if MSHA eyeballs it and say, doesn't look like it stopped quick enough to me, they'll issue you a citation. You know, you can fight it, you know, but think about it, look at this, and it, since you know they're going to be focusing on this, make them, uh, you know, stand up to their, uh, their requirements. Um, it's not impeding their inspection as long as you provide them with an open area where they can do that test um, and see how it goes. So um, again, take a look at that one because that's a little bit of a, a, a sneaky defense you have to these break citations that people rarely exercise. But if you don't point out to them, hey, you didn't test the brakes right, you're kind of stuck at that point. So uh, that concludes my presentation. I, I know I did run over, but um, I can certainly stay on uh, a bit longer here and let's see what questions we have. Um, and uh, the information on the MSHA stakeholder meeting uh, is also in the chat. So anybody who missed that as I was whipping through those slides, uh, you can find it there. Uh, but I will turn this back over now to uh, Ms. Kim and Thanks. see what we have going on. Thanks, Adele. Yeah, I noticed um, that MSHA stakeholder meeting. Um, you, you could the uh, the link there will take you to where you can register online to uh, to listen in. Um, but in the RSVP is where you can add uh, questions. Um, so anyway, so if you get to that, and link, I want um, I want to clarify on that, yeah. Kim. The RSVP technically closed yesterday. Yeah, but that I believe was really for the the question part because the links that were in uh what in my slide, there's a call and phone number and passcodes and there's a WebEx link. Those you can do without pre-registering. Great. Okay. Uh, great. It's just if you and any and I will tell you because I've been on a lot of these, especially if they wrap it up, you know, if they're formal part ends early and they don't have a lot of questions in queue, they will open the phone lines and there is a way to unmute yourself, but they will put you in queue. So they will control that part. But if you didn't already pre-register, there is still an opportunity to get a question in. Okay, perfect. Yep. And that starts at 1 p.m. today. Um, and the link is, should be in that chat. Um, there you, be square. <laughs> <laughs> there's, uh, or go down to Alexandria. Um, if you have, we still, you still have a couple minutes to go ahead and put questions in. Uh, there are a couple there that Kate will address. Um, and I'll share a couple things here. Um, first of all, I know Adele, thank you. I know that was a lot of content, but, um, but we will uh, have Adele's presentation and the video loaded onto our website um, right here on our safety webinars page probably by tomorrow or the next day, that'll be available. So great, if great. you uh, missed something or you wanted to, to go back and um, check on some things, um, that'll be available. Two things definitely sh you drove home today. Uh, that was train and document. So um, <laughs> two very, seems very simple, but I, I did want to let um, the folks that attended here today know that we do have, um, for the OSHA side, we've got an OSHA, the 7215 um, training course that'll be offered via Zoom in a couple of months. Uh, that class is a one-day class that uh, covers development and implementation of controls and strategies to prevent uh, or mitigate silica exposures. Uh, there's a lot of um, interest um, and, and uh, in that class. Um, we look forward to you joining us for that. Um, and then, of course, the OSHA 511 General Standards four-day course will cover um, the OSHA version of, of what the standards are as well. So I just wanted to hit on that. Um, and like Adele said, we will. Um, our conference is coming up in September, on September 26th. And we still have availability for not only attending, but exhibitors, um, sponsorships. And we look forward to having as many of you there as possible. It's going to be a great day. And I'm sure Adele will be on hand. Um, either at our at the exhibitor table or presenting, um, or both, and, uh, or both, or, or very likely both. <laughs> and uh, and um, you know, I do have the questions in queue up. And before we run out of time, I, yeah. I wanted to answer them. They were both from Cheryl. Great, um, go ahead. And and the first was, what about construction involving tunneling? And construction tunneling 
is under OSHA. And if you look at the 1978 OSHA-MSHA Interagency Memorandum of Understanding, which I, I can send anybody a link to if they want to email me, um, they do delineate the distinction between the construction type demolition, blasting, and, uh, and tunneling activities and those that are done for mining. Uh, but make no mistake, if you are doing shaft and slope construction at a permitted mine site, that will be covered under the MSHA standard. Um, and, and the second part of that was uh, about uh, doing blasting for preparation at a construction site for uh, utilities or highway and heavy construction. That also would be under OSHA. You know, uh, most of my blasting clients, probably 90% of their work is under OSHA. Uh, but if you are doing construction at a mine site, and that includes, you know, MSHA's, uh, definition of a mine site is pretty broad. I hate to say it, folks. It includes roads that are pertinent to the mine if they are going to be used to access the mines. And so you might be doing a road building project and do some blasting to build the, the road from the public road to the mine. And you may think, well, I'm just building the darn road. I'm under OSHA. Um, and you may find, much to your dismay, that you are under MSHA. I have had that case. It was called Cox Transportation. So, um, you know, be careful um, about how you're defining things. And if you're signing a contract and they're saying in that in their ma 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 blah blah blah, you're com going to comply with uh, all OSHA and MSHA standards, you may want to throw up a flag and go, "Yo, why are you including MSHA in here?" And you may find out that the project actually is not a greenfield operation, but it is an expansion of an existing facility, or maybe the tunneling work is going to be part of an underground mine, or even maybe a tunnel that's going to be used, you know, for, uh, you know, running pipes at a mine. Um, you know, that is done quite a bit where, where they are uh, running stuff under the ground um, into tunnels at a mine site. That kind of tunneling, even if it's not slope and shaft development, would be under MSHA jurisdiction. And I'm gonna throw one more in there just to make you crazy, uh, Cheryl. MSHA does not uh, automatically recognize OSHA's crane standard either. Um, I handled that case as, as an amicus uh, counsel for the Specialized Crane and Rigging Association. Um, and after that, MSHA adopted a policy saying that generally we will follow the OSHA crane standard, but we reserve the right not to kind of, um, just like they do not follow the OSHA fall protection standard either. Um, so uh, there's a lot of differences between OSHA and MSHA. And maybe we'll explore that. Uh, we've, we've done that in a webinar in the past. We might do it again. But thank you for those questions, because that is an area that can generate a lot of confusion for contractors. Hey, is there anything we're missing in the Q&A or any follow-up questions you have? We got everything covered there. That's all I see. So yeah, uh, thank you covered. all so much. And you know how to reach me if you need me. Thank you, Adele. We appreciate everybody coming and uh, we'll get this presentation loaded up on the website right away so that you can uh, um, gather this information and share it. We appreciate you. All right. Everybody stay safe and healthy. Stay cool, everyone. I too. <laughs> Thank you.